Day 847 of the Ukrainian war map, also known as the Russo-Ukrainian war. Juzzy here, and today is another update as I take a simplified and down-to-earth approach to some of the most important happenings on the ground in Ukraine. So, starting off, we'll take a look at those Russian losses as currently Russia sits on more than 530,000 military personnel losses, which represents an additional 1,170 in the past day. Then as for hardware losses, so 3 tanks, 18 APVs, and a whopping 45 artillery which is represented in such a way that the general staff of the armed forces of Ukraine include big guns all the way down to portable mortars, all in a single metric. So this is one of the representations I'm working on right now for my upcoming videos. Then headed across to the map and starting out in Russia's Krasnodar Krai region. As in the early hours of this morning, Ukrainian attack drones targeted the Afpitsky refinery. The Look Oil, oil depot, was hit around 2.30am, leading to a significant fire at the facility. At least one drone struck the depot, igniting multiple vehicles and causing extensive damage. And being that the target destination is near the coast of the Black Sea, then to visualise the path of opportunity for the UAVs to reach their destination, one such likely path would be in a southeast trajectory from Odessa flying over the Black Sea at low altitudes to avoid detection. This route would maximize stealth and minimize the risk of interception, ensuring the drone maintains a low radar profile and utilizes advanced navigation systems to stay on course. Now, as for Russia, they should have this coastal region lined up and layered up with air defense systems, but it's simply not the case. So you could almost say Russia has sent most of their available air defenses to another country entirely. But there's more to this story because just overnight, two oil depots were hit by more Ukrainian UAVs. One in the Tambov region of Russia, about 400 kilometers from the front lines, and one in the Republic of Adygea, 340 kilometers from the front lines. What a devastated night it's been for Russia. Then in a similar story, the oil depot in the port of Azov in Rostov continued to burn two days after a Ukrainian drone attack. The region's governor reported that the fire, fueled by the depressurization of a second tank, caused the inextinguishable continuation of the fire that outpaced any firefighting efforts to contain the blaze. Russian telegrammers from the military chimed in on the matter and stated, quote, the Kyiv regime is destroying Russia's economic potential. And that is a fairly acceptable analysis of the situation, or better to say, the Kremlin regime is destroying Russia's economic potential. It's all a matter of perspective, really. Then we'll head across to Ukraine, where it was a little less eventful of a day by comparison, but take for instance, in the Northern Front, as Ukrainian forces recaptured positions near to Staritsia, without any map updates to show for it yet. Then headed further down, near to occupied Donetsk city, as the invaders were pushed back marginally, and that was just south of Alexandropol, which is on the Avdivka axis. Oh, meanwhile, further north, the invading forces offset those losses with marginal gains just west of Ploschanka as they clearly look to use this angle of attack to reach all the way up to the river in an attempt to consolidate new gains. Then in the east, we saw an FPV drone land gracefully inside a Russian tank before finishing the job. And they really seem to savor the moment for an extra five seconds or so on that one. Then in the east, another Russian turtle tank destroyed, although with a more stealthy profile or design, but the tank's cannon was still obstructed from movement. And it's interesting that this destruction was caused by a reusable FPV drone which simply dropped an ammunition on the top of the tank and flew away in victorious flight. Then, thank our lucky stars, we saw yet another. So this one's a Russian Zala reconnaissance drone targeted by a UAV by the AFU. Unfortunately, there was no secondary recon drone to show us the outcome of the event, but the blast's impact should likely have succeeded in its intended purpose. 
then headed all the way up north, all the way up there, as according to reports from a Finnish public broadcaster, Russia has now redeployed nearly all of its ground forces previously stationed near the Finnish border to Ukraine. A senior Finnish military intelligence source revealed that about 80% of the equipment and soldiers have been transferred to the war effort in the south, leaving many bases without equipment and minimal personnel. Gee, looks like the lucky ones got to stay here. Now, bear in mind that Finland just joined NATO about 12 months ago, so this move contrasts with Russia's earlier claims of reinforcing its troops near Finland in response to its NATO membership. And we already knew some time ago that Russia was siphoning off some of its equipment and manpower from this very northern region to use it in the war with Ukraine, but it now appears that Russia's military presence has been completely stripped down to the barest of essentials on this newly minted NATO border front. This should not be the case, but it is, because Russia continues to pour everything it has into Ukraine, piece by piece. Talk about putting all your eggs in one basket. Then headed across to some news for today, so Romania approves the transfer of a Patriot air defense system to Ukraine in a move that comes after Kyiv has intensified its efforts to secure more of the systems as Russia continues its strikes on Ukraine's infrastructure centers. This new pledge, along with a recent new pledge from Germany, should go a long way to help in protecting the Kharkiv airspace, for example, for where they are sorely needed. Then in some more news, American defense giant Northrop Grumman has announced plans to produce ammunition in Ukraine funded by Ukrainian resources. The initial project involves manufacturing medium caliber munitions, like that of the 30mm rounds used in various combat vehicles and air defense systems, followed by ambitions to expand into tank ammunition and 155mm artillery shells. The announcement comes amid the present need for robust defense infrastructure that ensures Ukraine's military preparedness and enhances its ability to respond to potential threats and supply needs swiftly and effectively. Then in some Russian hardware supply updates of a sort, a popular Russian Air Force adjacent Telegram channel is complaining about the low supply of new Su-34 jets for Russian aviation needs as he states that the first batch of two Su-34 jets were delivered to the military, if you can call two a batch. And he also gripes about the fact that at least two Russian Su-34 jet losses occurred due to non-combat reasons since May 5th this year. That's right, at least two since early last month. For example, because of mechanical failure and or friendly fire reasons. Although strangely, the telegrammer can't confirm if these were new or restored jets. But if they were to be new, then they'd likely be somewhat watered down variants of their predecessors due to their reliance on a plethora of expensive and high-end Western technology that is no longer available to produce the jets with. But ultimately, the telegrammer signs off saying that these two jets are just too little to work with. Then headed across to some more news, so the biggest news from the last two or three days, of course, is that Russian President Vladimir Putin made a rare visit to North Korea on Wednesday, marking the first time since Putin visited the country since the year 2000. Putin and North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un signed a partnership agreement in Pyongyang, marking a new era of cooperation between the two pariah nations. The treaty pledges mutual aid in case of an attack on either country and hints at future military collaboration. Kim Jong-un described the agreement as peaceful and defensive and hailed Russia as North Korea's most honorable friend and ally. Although most honorable might not mean much given the other dictatorships that they hang around with. Now, while the specific details of this latest partnership agreement remains undisclosed, the leaders highlighted plans for economic, political, and military cooperation, all of which is extremely likely to be in violation of international sanctions. So it's no surprise Putin hasn't visited North Korea for a quarter of a century. Back in the old days, you know about them, the old Kim Jong-il days. But it occurs to me that the only way these two can talk with each other face-to-face -face without interpreters is by speaking English. 
the language of their stated enemies. Now, certainly, Russia is trading food for North Korean artillery shells in this arrangement, as we've seen thousands upon thousands of container shipments suspiciously sent from North Korea to Russia in recent times. But it hasn't been overly reflective of or representative of Russia's shelling rates within this war, which in turn supports the generally accepted notion that North Korea is sending all of their very dangerously old and warped Soviet artillery shell stockpiles that tend to have the opposite of the intended effect, which is to destroy the barrels that they're being used in, with a few examples on the screen there. Then to the funnies, leaning heavily on the recent North Korean visit because an event like this is always destined to make us laugh one way or the other. And I don't even know where to start, truly. So here we go, in no particular order. We saw this awkward moment of silence where Putin was playing with his microphones with such a look of defeat on his face. And everybody seemed to notice. Then, in another funny, and right before that meeting, it was seen that a North Korean official kicked out Russian ministers who entered the meeting room before Kim Jong-un. So at first, some sat down, then got told to get up and get out. The Russian occupation of the conference room was short-lived. Then I've got a brief funny on something of a theatre show moment, where Putin just looked like there was somewhere else that he thought he had to be. Then, for the last funny, this next one. But before I get into it, do you guys remember about a year ago or so, this real event turned video meme between the two leaders, where it seemed like neither leader trusted the simple concept of taking a sip of wine right after clinking glasses for a cheers. Well, now we have the follow-up to that event, and I call it Trust Issues Part 2. As in this latest example, when hopping into a car, both leaders seemed very determined to ensure that the other one took the right side passenger seat. In their heads, they're saying, no, you take the predetermined seat I allocated for you, and no, you take the predetermined seat that you allocated for me, I insist. Now, unfortunately, Putin lost that round. And perhaps for once in a very long time, feeling the pain of what it's like to be told to do something. But then, to me, out of all of it, perhaps the funniest thing is something I cannot even show you. I mean, imagine this. You had the chance for a real, sustainable economic connection with the globe and a bright future. Even free trade deals and visa-free travel was all on the table. But you screwed it up so badly that you somehow forcibly made yourself choose political bedfellows with the likes of Belarus, Iran and North Korea. That's just a sad story. So that's it for today, guys. Thanks again for watching. Please continue to like, comment, subscribe, and yeah, I do hope to see all of you guys there in the next one. Cheers.